Good evening, everybody, and a big welcome here to this session in the Oxford Real Farming Conference. Um, I couldn't be more pleased about the prospect of spending an hour in the company of our speaker and thinker and all round quite amazing person, Francis Moore Lappe. I'm Rosie Boycott. I'm a food activist and I work in politics and I was a journalist. I'm now a crossbench peer. That's all you need to know about me. But in terms of our guest tonight, she has a quite extraordinary story. Right back in 1971, she wrote a book called The Diet for a Small Planet. And when all of us were thinking about completely different things, somehow Frances was on the money completely. And this book, which she is going to produce, again, an updated 50th anniversary edition next fall, does still read as though it's just been written today. And all the concerns that she comes up with, which you're going to hear about in her talk, are all the concerns that we have, which is both amazing, um, uplifting, also slightly depressing when you think that we've still got an awfully long way to go. But that wasn't all that she has done in her quite remarkable life. She's the co-author or author of 19 other books about world hunger, about living democracy and the environment. Recently, she has been working on this new chapter for the diet for a small planet. New York Magazine said that she had been one of the most influential people in terms of the way that people eat, literally 25 people from Thomas Jefferson through to Julia Child, she's on that list. She's that influential. She is really like a, you know, a, a person who set the scene for so much of what is to come. She's appeared in every magazine under the sun, Harper's New York Times. She's been on the Today Show. She's been on the BBC. She's received 20 honorary degrees, and she's an extremely sought-after public speaker. So that's one of the many reasons why we're so pleased to have her here tonight. In 1987, she received something amazing called the Right Livelihood Award, which in a way is a kind of alternative Nobel Prize given to people who really have contributed towards our understanding of the world and our commitment to democracy. And her commitment to democracy has become an enormous part of her working life. She is the founder of three very influential national organizations, the Oakland-based Food First, the Center for Living Democracy, which we're going to hear about, and her current home, the Cambridge-based Small Planet Institute, which was co-founded with her daughter, Anna Thappe. So with no further ado, we're going to hear a talk from Frankie for 30 minutes or so, then she and I will chat, and then we can have some time to take some questions from all of you. So when you think of a question, please stick them in the chat box and we will try to get through as many as we can. We never manage that completely, but we'll do our best. Anyway, for now, sit back and absolutely appreciate. I wish we were all in a room where we could give her a thundering round of applause. Please welcome Francis Moore Lappe. Thank you so very, very, very much. I am profoundly honored to be sharing my stories with you in this extraordinary conference. And I have to say, I'm also humbled today to be talking about food and democracy at a time when my own democracy's capital has suffered a frightening attack by our own citizens. So I hope that my talk can in some way help us understand and address the very roots of what is really a worldwide crisis for democracy. So thank you so very much for this honor. Now, let me start with one observation set against the California fires, you see. It says, it is far too late and things are far too bad for pessimism. But to escape pessimism, or even worse, despair, I believe we must know very deeply how our own power can be part of the solutions. And I mean solutions touching root causes. So for that, we need a theory of how we got here. And if you'll, Allow me, I'll share mine with you right now. And to do that, I've got to go back half a century, as Rosie said, it's 1970s, and Paul Ehrlich's population bomb had just exploded. It was, the experts were telling us that we were overrunning the Earth's capacity to feed us. And I was at that time 26, I guess, when I started this, and I had to know, food is so important. I had to know, is scarcity, really our problem. So there I am 
pondering the question. But soon I said I got to figure this out. And with my dad's original slide rule, I still have, if you know what that is, I kind of buried myself in the UC Berkeley Agricultural Library, kind of putting two, two and two together. And what I discovered is that there is was more than enough, more than enough, and that we're, we were actually creating the experience of scarcity for hundreds of millions, no matter how much we were growing. So I wrote a one page handout that became Diet for a Small Planet. And that then a century and a, a, a half a century later, I'm still asking that question a lot of people are, is scarcity the problem today? And my answer to that is not exactly, <laughs> because for every person, every day, the world now produces one fifth more than when I sat down to write Diet for a Small Planet. It comes to 2,900 calories for each of us. That would make a lot of us chubby. So, and we must keep this in mind note very, very well. That all that food I just described, that's only what's left over. What's left over after. Almost half of our grain now goes to feed livestock, fuel, and for other um, industrial purposes. And after over 80% of our agricultural land worldwide goes to livestock that provide only 18% of our calories. One third of all food is literally wasted. So it is kind of hard to imagine a less efficient way to feed ourselves. So have things gotten better or worse is my next question. And in some ways, both that certainly the share of hungry people has gone down. But even as there is more food for each of us today, still 690 million people lack sufficient calories. Two billion of us suffer moderate to extreme food insecurity. Now, these measures capture primarily quantity not the quality, not nutrition. And so we have to look at that. Poor nutrition leaves one in five small children today, young children stunted. And please know stunting is not just a problem of being short for your age. It has lifelong harms. Now get this, as corporate processed foods proliferate in our world, calories and nutrition part ways. So now in the majority of countries, Poor diet is the leading risk factor for death. Now here is yet another shocker I couldn't have, I didn't predict certainly. And that is that in feeding ourselves, um, excuse me, I forgot to go there and there. Uh, in feeding ourselves um, that we um, are contributing to the climate crisis. We are contributing to the climate crisis. What I mean by that is you can see here on the slide, 21 to 37 percent of greenhouse gases coming from our food system and our dietary choices matter a great deal. Our dietary choices really <laughs> have a varying effect. Now, um, uh, when we look at this chart, we see that um, beef, for example, has, you know, 20 to almost 60 times greater greenhouse gas emissions for each bite of food than do at the top vegetable protein foods. So that is very dramatic difference. So for 50 years, I've been digging into the question, why would such a bright species as ours uh, do this, that every other species feeds itself, first of all. So my questions kept growing until I got to this question. Why are we together creating a world uh, that none of us as individuals would choose. Why would a species waste its precious food and even turn it into a health hazard? So what is the answer to that? And my, my tentative answer, I want your feedback, is that we humans are uniquely creature, creatures of the mind. That we see the world not as it is, but as we are. We see the world through filters, creating kind of mental maps. They literally determine what we can see and what we cannot see. Now, Einstein put it pretty clearly. He said, it is theory which decides what we can observe. So please let us forget the old adage, seeing is believing. No, 
for humans believing is seeing. And today's dominant mental map that limits our vision, I call scarcity mind. Scarcity mind is scary. <laughs> it is organized in, I think, by three concepts, three assumptions that are perversely aligned with nature and wider nature. The three S's are separateness. We see life as in disconnected parts. Stasis, that is, <laughs> things are pretty static, especially human nature. And finally, scarcity itself. And the scarcity that we're in the grip of is that we lack just about everything from uh, what we need to thrive and human goodness as well. So the scarcity mind is fear driven and fear stoking. And worst of all, it draws us into a downward self-reinforcing spiral of powerlessness. That it's starting with the premise of not enoughness, not enough goodness in us and not enough good to share. Um, we think that, oh yeah, if we just peel away the fluff of human nature, we're, all we are is just competitive, selfish, and materialistic. With that comes distrust. We distrust ourselves, the other, and so, of course, we distrust democracy, leaving us no choice, really, but to turn over our fate to the market. Ronald Reagan called it magical. Not any kind of market, though, because it is a market driven by a single rule. Bring highest return to wealth. So wealth accrues to wealth, accrues to wealth in a giant game of monopoly until we end up with this jaw-dropping reality today, worldwide. The richest 1% of us control half the world's wealth. And the spiral of powerlessness follows. And then great suffering. And of course, then um, uh, concentrated wealth hijacks democracy for its own ends. Now, I know in some of your countries, this hijack maybe is not as extreme as ours, but I want to just share with you the reality here. I think this captures a lot. For every one person elected to represent us, <laughs> citizens, in Washington, almost two dozen uh, mainly corporate lobbyists push their interests over ours. So private power drives public decision-making. And this is per one particular example, coming back to food, is the introduction of genetically modified organisms. It's a striking example of democracy's capture. They were introduced with virtually no independent review and now are in 75% of our processed foods in the US. And most likely, most widely used GMO seeds are tied to an herbicide glyphosate deemed a likely carcinogen by the WHO. Yet it's become the world's most widely used herbicide. So all of this quickens this spiral of powerlessness so of course, distrust of government intensified because conditions for the majority of people continue to sink while wealth goes to the top. All of that confirming our worst assumptions about human nature, speeding our decline and making us easily manipulatable by the powerful, leading to such tragic breakdown as what hit our capital yesterday. Now, we need to take a deep breath here. <laughs> so scarcity mind ends up, is my conclusion, ends up creating the very conditions that are now proven for our species to bring out the very worst. They are concentrated power, whether in political form, we see the horrific eruption of genocide, or concentrated economic power, which inures us to suffering of others and kills the competitive market. One example, just one example of so many, in the 1990s, hundreds of seed companies competed Whereas today, just four control more than 60% of the global seed market. Second condition is secrecy. And I mean secrecy, whether it's Wall Street or it's the propaganda machines like those pulling hidden strings for Brexit or Donald Trump. Secrecy elicits the worst in us. And finally, the condition of a blaming culture. Misery leads us to finger pointing at those bad people especially targeting racial minorities or poor or immigrants. And all of that blaming then blinds us to the system roots that we must grapple with. So this belief system of scarcity mind 
creates a spiral of powerlessness proven to bring out the conditions that bring out our worst. That's why I think we're in such a mess. It helps explain so much. From this mindset, not only is a huge share of humanity blocked from meeting our deepest uh, physical needs, but also beyond the physical, this mindset prevents us from three other essential human needs being met. Our need for agency or power, our need for meaning in our lives, and third, connection. Our need to experience our power and meaning in community with others. With these three essentials denied so many, it's no surprise that we die more from suicide than all of armed conflict and natural disasters today combined. So let's take a deep breath because there is some good news I want to turn to now. And I want to say my favorite word in the English language. It is neoplasticity. The scientists are telling us that in fact, our brains are not fixed. Scientists tell us that new thoughts create new neural pathways and we can move to a more reality-based ecological worldview that I love to call eco-mind. In this mindset, we, we can leave behind the deadly S's and we can move to a very different worldview. We see the obvious in a way that uh, reality is not separation, but connection. Uh, we can move from st the concept of static stasis, you know, to the idea of continuous change. And we can move from the fixed scarcity to the reality that we are constantly co-creating together. And with this new lens, we see very differently. I most profoundly, the most profound difference is that we see everything as shaped by relationship. And as I say those words, the beautiful face of Hans Peter Dürer, the late Hans Peter Dürer, a German physicist and a dear friend who once said to me, Frankie, in biological systems, there are no parts, there are only participants. I said, yeah, I got it, Hans Peter. Our relationships greatly determine what qualities show up in each of us. And in this world of continuous change, scarcity is not fixed as we are all co-creators. And the implication in this worldview is that not one of us is utterly powerless. If we're all connected in continuous change, then every act we sh take shapes the world around us. And I will return to that as I close in a while. From all this, it seems our task is super clear that we can identify what brings out the worst in us, and then we can create the conditions proven to bring forth the best in us. We can, uh, instead of uh, economic and political ra realities uh, that are aligned um, with our negativity, we can align it with what human nature needs and, why, and what wider nature needs from us. So with this clarity, we can actively discredit, actively discredit, the historical narrative dominant today that progress happens when the good guys vanish, vanquish the bad guys. That is not working. It's helped draw angry people to storm our capital for one thing. That's not working. Instead, we can consciously shape a new frame. It starts with acknowledging our species proven complexity. Yes. With the wrong conditions, virtually all of us can be nasty brutes. We've seen that. But also, uh, we are the most social primate. We evolve with profoundly positive capacities. They are, first, cooperation. Have you ever heard about that study where they looked at our brains while we were cooperating instead of competing? And they found that our brains react in our pleasure centers as if we're eating chocolate when we're cooperating. That's how much we've been reinforced. Cooperation is a good thing. And in empathy, we find that even toddlers with no adult prodding enjoy helping others. And fairness? Well, we've all heard of Adam Smith, right? The supposed godfather of greed. Well, two and a half centuries ago, he wrote that humans feel tied, bound, and obliged the, uh, to the observation of justice. And he observed so tenderly that a precept of nature is to love ourselves only as we love our neighbor. 
With all this, we can take a deep breath in. We can leave this fearful scarcity frame behind and move into a spiral of empowerment and possibility. Empowerment and possibility. So given that we have both qualities, we can come together to repair and advance democracy. Democracy able to create the worlds that reinforce and bring out those positive capacities and keep wealth and power in check. It then becomes self-reinforcing as well. As more and more of us see ourselves capable of creating the conditions that bring forth the best, the opposite uh, of what brings out the worst, of course. And so what are those conditions that we have shown to bring out the best in us? Well, I'll, again, I love threes, you can see. Um, one is the continuous co-creation and dispersion of power, transparency. Uh, I love this story. I don't know if you've heard this before, but I read about UK professors who weren't paying for their coffee at the honor system coffee station in their department. So one prof just pinned a photo of human eyes looking down on the coffee station. And guess what? The professor started paying up. So in that story, it's even the thought that somebody is watching us. We behave better. And finally, this theme of of mutual accountability, not finger pointing. Uh, if we're all connected, we're all implicated. As Rabbi Joshua Heschel put it, some are guilty, but we're all responsible. We Americans, we cannot simply blame Donald Trump. Why did we allow this to happen? These three conditions then confine, define what I see emerging. What I see emerging today, I love to call living democracy. It is not a fixed structure we inherit. It is a way of life. It is what we not what we have, but what we do. A way of life that is a journey that has never an end to it. And it's a journey to create the positive conditions, not just in political life, but economic and cultural life that have proven to bring out the very best in us that I mentioned earlier. And to meet the deepest human needs I mentioned earlier as well, agency our need to know we count, meaning in our lives, and connection with others in a word to serve human dignity. So 50 years ago, I realized that food has special power to awaken us on this journey. And today I feel even more strongly that rethinking, that rethinking food and land has this incredible power to awaken us to the ecological worldview and to get it really into our bones as we manifest living democracy, to leave that scarcity frame behind. Why uh, this, I'm sure many of you would agree with this, that food has very special power. Food has very special power. Sorry, I jumped ahead there. Food has very special power to um, teach us. Did you know that the root meaning, for example, of co companion is with bread? So food connects us certainly to the earth, but also to others, to our companions. And how do humans create new ways of seeing and being to take us beyond the bad guys, trampling the bad guys? How do we do this? How do we create this new story? And how is food part of our way of doing this? So. Um, I believe that these frames are built by stories, narratives that we create, and we can all become, therefore, storytellers, tellers of stories of living democracy emerging, especially, especially perhaps among those assumed to be the least powerful people on our planet. They are leading this ecological revolution. They are restoring, they are restoring, um, they are restoring farming and feeding that embody the three positive conditions and they are mitigating the climate crisis by generating plant and planter centered eating all of that so i want to share with you in terms of storytelling something that really has impressed me is that just very recently uh my heroes helping us to see with new eyes um are uh are tracking um stories of this bottom-up revolution. They include uh, Professor Jules Pretty and his extensive team at the University of Sussex. 
And just a couple months ago, they released their astonishing findings that in just two decades, 2000 to 2020, 8 million, 8 million social groups emerged across 55 countries, collaborating, creating exactly the positive conditions for human thriving, power sharing, transparency, and being mutual accountable to each other as they set and enforce the rules together, all from the ground up. Yeah, just 20 years in 55 countries, 80, not 8 million people, but 8 million new social groups, reviving and sustaining life through farming and forestry. Now, I just wanna tell you a couple of specific stories that have long moved me as I began, uh, uh, I've been following since the 80s what's been happening in one of the poorest countries in the world, Niger. Now, it experienced devastating famine in the 80s, but the Niger, Niger farmers then led the way in building on traditional practices and learning new ones. They began to see that trees and crops don't compete. Together as agroforestry, they offer huge benefits, higher yields, and so much more and of course, carbon sequestration. So even by 2009, agroforestry there, uh, they're often called farmer managed natural regeneration, has brought to, had brought 200 million more trees to the country and food security for two and a half million people, about a 10th of the population. Now, no one knows for sure how much agroforestry is spread throughout the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, but one expert, extrapolated that now it could cover more than half a million square miles. That would be about the size of the country of Chad. Now, my own special personal encounter with the kind of stories that Jules Preddy and his team are tracking around the world um, occurred in a few years ago when I visited uh, some folks uh, not over oh, a couple hours from Hyderabad in, I visited a village there of the Deccan Development Society people. They, the people I talked to, the women I met, were of Dalit people, the lowest caste for so many years, considered the least powerful. There I got to sit, encircled by these women, again, the Deccan Development Society, and listen to their story. They told me that they, just a couple of decades ago, every single day, every day they had to fend off hunger. They told me they felt humiliated and powerless and almost hopeless. But then a few began meeting weekly at night after the kids were in bed, then more joined in and they began pooling their tiny savings and to get unused land that had been degraded and they pledged to bring it to life again. So here you see with their arms outstretched, they are making pledges to one another. They are pledging no GMOs, no use of pesticides or other chemicals, and third, they are committing to share their knowledge. And so for that, they petitioned for six years to get their own radio station. Walking in their fields, I felt the pride as they showed me this amazing mix of crops, with the full complement of nutrition. The approach is now spread to 75 villages and, and they even convinced the regional government to procure their healthy millets for school lunches, replacing the empty calorie white rice. Now they told me over and over with beaming faces, there is no hunger in our villages. Now also note in India that the nearby state of Andhra Pradesh has set the goal for chemical beef free farming by 2024. So now let me begin to wrap up. I certainly heard, I hope you've heard me say more or less that hunger is not caused by a scarcity of food, but a scarcity of democracy. We must dig to the deepest questions of living democracy. What is the soil in which democracies thrive? In my country, the soil has been thinned, it's been poisoned as the frame of good guys battling evil has intensified. Our determination to spread a new story must gain strength in which we accept the complete complex humanity and get busy creating the conditions of governance that embody the three conditions that bring out the very best in us. And so those nourishing the soil of living democracy, remember dispersion of power, transparency, and mutual accountability, and not the blame game. So in this Citizens on the March for Living Democracy, here I am beaming almost as much as the Deccan Development Society women. Why am I beaming? 
This in 2016 was one of the happiest moments of my life. I took part in 100 mile march the capital steps peacefully asking to remove the grip of private wealth on our democracy. And why why so happy? I realized that with all the diverse people in our group that more and more of us were getting it. And this is true across countries that we realize whatever our issue passion, right? Is it racial justice? Is it climate crisis? Is it healthy food? Whatever it is, we understand we can only succeed with democracy. And for us in the US, that means deep system reforms. So Trump's election reflected, remember, decades of voter suppression and vast increase in manipulation by uh, wealth in our, in our political system. So here we are in a moment when life on earth is at stake and democracy is damaged, even where long established. So very personally now, I'm gonna get more personal. What is required? What is required, I like to call bold humility. Bold humility. It means rethinking, rethinking fear and power. So, and thinking rather in terms of living in possibility. Now, let me start with the humility part. As we act to protect the precious life remaining on earth and gener generate new life, let's be clear. On matters in life and death, humans have never needed certainty or even a high probability of success to jump in. Besides, given the nature of life in connection and continuous change, it is really silly to think that we can predict the, the results of our action. So I like to live with this motto that it is simply not possible to know what's possible. By that, I mean that we don't have to be optimists claiming we can predict, but rather the very uncertainty has freedom within it. Ultimately, therefore, I declare myself not an optimist. Instead, I am a dive in the wool possibilist today. Now, to be a possibilist, uh, I want to move to the bold part of bold humility. And that is that our courage starts in appreciating the power that we have. I'll just mention a couple pieces of that power. That um, we have, as I say, the only choice we don't have is whether to change the world because every act we take sends out ripples. Someone is always watching. And with an eco mind, we can see that as we align our daily choices with what is good for the earth and all of us, we become more powerful. My individual acts, I realized 50 years ago, didn't change the world, but they changed me. <laughs> The more aligned I am with my truth, the more convincing I become to myself, and thus a stronger participant in our common struggle for life. And three, while we often hear human nature lambasted as too individualistic, maybe, maybe our biggest challenge is the opposite. Our Achilles heel might be that we are hypersocial. We're so social that we each need uh, um, that we need so much approval from others that breaking with the pack is the scariest thing. And when the pack is shouting, our problem is the other, those nasty brutes, and we know we should speak out to challenge to go deeper, it's scary. So how do we become more courageous? Appreciating our social nature, we choose our heroes, we choose our friends carefully. We hang out with courage. We hold our heroes in our hearts and become close to those more willing to risk than we have been. We can count on change in ourselves because we are social creatures and courage is therefore contagious. So what the Decon, that this is what the Decon development women discovered. And so as I was leaving their village, they rushed after me. They rushed after me and they said to me, those lines on the slide, wait, 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 wait. What we forgot to tell you is that what we gain most from our Sangam, the women's group, is courage. And you can see it in their beautiful faces. Our immediate lesson then for all of us here participating in the Oxford Real Farming Conference today and in the days ahead, even in our virtual world, reach out, connect with participants who, um, and don't be shy about it. Like the DDS women, we can make pledges to each other. We can join with others to do at least one thing we thought we could not do. And I like to think, ah, oh, that pounding heart that wants to stop me, maybe we can reframe that too. Could it really be just our inner applause telling us, uh, cheering us on, that is? Together we can learn to walk with fear. 
walk with fear use that fear energy we can feel our power fed by purpose to protect life itself and in connection with others so courage is our birthright it is our power in this life and death moment let us glory in it thank you so very very much thank you so much francis thank you that was an absolutely mind-blowingly wonderful talk with so many thoughts and ideas in it as well as your final call which of course put me in mind of one of the famous banners of the suffragettes which was courage calls to courage everywhere and yeah. that's the the lines on the statue of Wilson Fawcett a famous suffragette which is in uh, Westminster now so uh -huh. that was wonderful um Right, I need to ask you a few things that, uh, you know, on your way through, there were so many interesting things. One of them was, you know, that we, in a way, we've designed a system that no one, of us, no one would want. And yet, at the same time, you know, we have ended up in a society that is, that runs on the scarcity principle, that, you know, we are vulnerable to advertisers, to the ideas of wealth, to national lotteries, to all these things that are, we know, are terribly damaging to us. How can these small organizations that you talk about, and that's a fantastic statistic from uh, Jules Pretty about how many organizations are, how can they take on the 1% that own half the wealth? Well, it's not a direct path. I think that our job is to let the world know, uh, our job in the industrialized world, uh, and, and also spread the word about what's happening in our own countries that people aren't hearing about that are similar. Uh, I, in writing the new chapter for Diet for Small Planet, I realized that there's agroforestry initiatives right here in the US I had no idea about. So I think, again, this theme of what we most need to do is get the word out because I do believe that despair is our worst enemy now. And uh, I feel it particularly strongly in the United States. But so I think, uh, spread the word, tell groups about other groups who are working on similar uh, uh, work and, and make connections with those. I think that is that is the key, that it's still too invisible. It's mm. so invisible. Uh, most people never uh, have heard of the things that, that I'm describing here. So you say that they're invisible, and I would completely agree with you about that. But your first slide in your talk was of the California fires. Now, Climate change is something that is extremely visible, well, to me, and I think to anyone who puts their head above the parapet. And it's been very interesting in this last year that certainly in the UK and maybe less in America, but certainly in most countries, COVID struck, governments were able to literally turn on a sixpence, institute lockdowns, get people to wear masks, whatever. And yet we have a much bigger threat coming at us. And as human beings, we seem very bad at being able to look into the future. We're very good with a threat that's right here, I'm going to punch you in the nose, but we're very bad about anything long-term. And I think I do think that's one of the reasons why we drifted into so much bad food, for instance. We don't think of consequence. How do we change that? Well, I don't want to sound like a broken record, <laughs> but I am. Um, that fundamentally, we have to have governance that hears these voices. That I mentioned GMOs just out of, you know, as one example. But the corporate control of food, the degradation of our diet is so extreme in this country. Now, the vast majority of Americans don't get the nutrients they need because of the dominance of corporate uh, advertising and corporate uh, and, and extreme poverty. So people who live in so many communities in, in the U.S., they don't have access to fresh food. So I think it's hard for me to envision solutions that don't involve that very fundamental question of how do we remove corporate power. Um, now, agribusiness spends more money on lobbying um, Washington than the defense industry is just one example. So we have to, we have to uh, really call that out. And that's why the democracy movement, um, that's why the democracy movement um, is really new here. The idea of people coming across uh, all sorts of um, across you know all sorts of issues to combine their energies together to focus on democracy reform and with very specific change in the rules because we have had for example a couple of states with very successful public financing elections but that has just been blocked and nobody even knows that's true 
uh, in the city of Seattle, people get uh, vouchers, democracy vouchers, where they can contribute so, uh, to candidate of their choice, but they are provided by the public to increase the number of people whose voices are heard in financing campaigns. So they're very specific um, rule changes in our democracy and in our economic life. Obviously, we've given, we've gone so far away from enforcing antitrust laws being mm -hmm. discussed again. But so I, I just feel that most important, I'll just say one more thing. I don't want to keep going no, on. No. But there is a now uh, our institute and a very much larger institute has a website um, for those of you who are interested in the wet in the U.S. or living here. It's called just democracymovement.us. And that's a place that you can learn about these reforms and join with others and maybe get that smile on your face that I got when I was uh, part of that march. So coming back to the, not coming back to, but staying with the issue of food. I mean, it's certainly true that I, and I know lots of people in the UK, you know, we always feel that if we could get the food system right, you'd sort of get everything right. Um, and that they're, they're very sort of, democracy and food is is like one thing. When, when did you find yourself going from being really around the food business into taking it broader? And do you still believe that, that if we could fix the food system, we'd fix a lot of stuff? Yeah, but, yes, but I don't think we can fix the food system, really fix it without democracy. And that's the, that's the um, key to it. I, I feel like we have that fundamentally, it's our governance that sets the rules. And if, if uh, our economic control is controlling that discussion, then we can't fix our food system. Uh, and I think to build that enthusiasm, again, storytelling. And I think, uh, well, a friend of mine once said to me, Frankie, you know, you can love two children at once. <laughs> and I have two kids and I love them both. So I got it that you can become engaged and aware and, and bringing this awareness to your allies and friends and people working with you in the food movement, uh, that it's not a one or the other. I think we have to move forward so fast because of climate crisis, mm -hmm. definitely the food, food is, is contributing and yet we food can be part of the cure. It's both the culprit and the cure. And so we've gotta be addressing climate change. We've gotta be addressing the health crisis of processed foods. Um, and uh, we have to devote some of our consciousness and weighing in and explaining to friends and neighbors how this relates to our democracy crisis that, yes, it's terribly uh, traumatic here in the United States, but around the world, democracy is being challenged. Absolutely. And we had a very interesting session earlier talking with people in India about, you know, Modi's proposal to take away subsidies and basic minimum payments for crops in India, which will end up with small farmers falling more into the need to sell their farms and therefore, you know, the corporate giants. I mean, you mentioned that now we have basically four seed companies in the world. These are enormous powers to have to take on board. And you just want, I mean, is, is someone like Joe Biden going to be strong enough to try to break some of these giants up? Well, I think that at least Joe Biden understands the problem and therefore the democracy movement has to push, push, push. You know, mm -hmm. our president Franklin Roosevelt is famous for having said, make me do it, make me do it. And clearly Joe Biden's heart is, I can think in the right place uh, much more. Uh, I don't know how sophisticated his analysis is, but he has to be able to see uh, the depth of the crisis of poverty and uh, our food crisis here is so extreme. So I, I, I think, it, again, it comes back to whether we organize enough as a movement. And I think that's probably true and, and insist and insist in peaceful, respectful ways that uh, this is not some, well, in the US, you know, it's some left wing plot if you talk about rules of government. So part of it, I think, is developing language. I talk about a democratic economy, mm -hmm. uh, not a social, not a social um, democratic socialism, because I, I want it for Americans, uh, average Americans, I really want them to hear uh, that democracy can be uh, applied, the, the, the 
principles of democracy can apply in in economic life. And one of the things I'm working on now is spreading the word about the degree to which cooperatives and public ownership of utilities in rural areas and around the U.S. they they operate. And it's not this big bad government up there uh, doing it to us, which is the fear of Americans that they've been made to fear government. So I think this key of making government a partner is what I hope mm -hmm. that uh, Biden and his allies will come come with a very different frame. Yes, I think public ownership is an incredibly interesting idea. My sister lives in Denmark and they have, for instance, they have always all publicly owned all the alternative energy, all the wind power. They used to own the ferry services. They were very, yeah. very good at spreading the bounty. And I mean, I've certainly seen in the UK that we have not done that when we've had big share offers like in British Telecom, you know, everyone sort of could buy some shares, but then of course it got, you know, things get reprivatized, the money disappears. That sense of empowerment goes from you because you're absolutely right when you say that you are your happiness, you're happiest when you're involved in a project, when you're on side with your friends or your colleagues and you, you sort of meet people and you remember those times in your life when you had that. And I, it, it's, it, you just, I suppose I just want, before I bring in the rest of the questions that are coming in quite thick. Yes, I also wanted to say, please, just that, you know, in, a, in this theme of it's not possible to know what's possible and being a possibleist, I think uh, very few Americans a few months ago would have predicted that our state of Georgia would uh, vote the way that it did and uh, reject the Trump agenda and, and vote uh, in um, people who are looking for another pathway. And I have to give a big shout out to the commitment to democracy of our African-American populations. Are, mm -hmm. I mean, that was phenomenal what they achieved in Georgia. And I just really want to praise the effort to bring democracy alive in that, in that campaign, those campaigns. Yeah, the Georgia story is incredibly heartening, actually. It's just yes. that somehow sneaked through the news when we were all having to watch. <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> Hill. Um, the, um, I'm just going to come a bit up with some, there's an interesting question, something that I was sort of going to ask you, but I see that a guy called Dennis, Dennis has asked it, that, that the scarcity myth has long been critiqued, and yet it seems so deeply embedded. What arguments have you found to be the most persuasive, that the true problem is one of access and availability, which is determined by power and politics? Well, I just c continue to repeat this, all of these statistics of abundance, and certainly the U.S., you know, it's a major food exporter, et cetera. I mean, we have so much food in this country, and yet uh, we have extreme food insecurity. And so I, I, I think we just have to keep that story going because that scarcity scare is such a, a fear-inducing. and. Um, when reality is exactly the opposite. As I say, we create the experience of scarcity and then that gets covered and people think, well, people wouldn't be going hungry if there was food, but mm -hmm. false, false. So I, I, I really think it's, again, we need to tell these stories in uh, more effective ways. And I think by telling about real people <laughs> and how they are addressing uh, uh, hunger in their communities is one way. So. Um, but I think also just continuing to blast out the statistics about the abundance <laughs> that exists today and how we are actively reducing it by continuing to feed so much of it to livestock and how that contributes to the climate crisis. When, of course, healthy diets of more plant-centered direction, we could uh, reduce drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. I know it's such a win-win that, that if we can you know, eat right, we also help the planet. It's the great Michael Pollan line, isn't it, about eat food, not too much, mostly vegetables. Um, yeah. And I think that, I mean, the best principle is the capitalist principle, isn't it? That you've never got enough. There's always something you could do. And it's basically your fault that you're not quite being able to do it. And that until you can upend that as part of the psychology, in fact, the next, uh, next question here is also, how do you suppose we make the necessary psychological intervention? that's needed to redirect us towards an ecocentric mindset. And it, it, we do live in a world where it's very difficult to break that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's interesting that uh, last night, Van Jones 
African-American, very famous newscaster here. He talked about Georgia in terms of the politics of joy, the politics of joy instead of politics of fear. And I think that that the more we can communicate, not a you should, you're bad because mm -hmm. you're eating too much of this or you're too hooked on junk food, but rather the joy and the excitement of sharing healthy food and the tastiness of it and not the you shoulds, but the we cans and this politics of joy. I think that is critical. And that's what I experienced in that long march that day. Uh, it was the politics of joy. There was one funny moment when it started hailing and we started chanting, hail, no, democracy, yes. And I thought that's a spirit, you know, just turn anything around and make it fun. And uh, so I think this politics of joy is, is a great phrase. And I think getting away from being the preachers, you know, that we have the answer and to look what, look what, what happens when we shift the frame and see the possibility. And I hope that that's a spirit that we can now move to with uh, a new president as we approach the Green New Deal that many of you have heard of, that this is a great win, win, win in terms of jobs, addressing economic inequality, addressing air pollution that suffer, that mm. the poorest of us here suffer the by far the most. So I, 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 despite what happened yesterday, I think that we can stay in this frame of possibility. Well, and weirdly, what happened yesterday may be something that was kind of needed in order to, you know, sometimes you have to have a big crisis to shift people to say, I, we really don't want this anymore and we're really going to do something about it. You know, I, 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 I hate to say, you know, with so much, so much suffering, I hate to, but since it has happened, I would <laughs> agree that, and I think the shame Americans like to claim that we're the best, right? That we're the best democracy. And I think there has to be some profound shame going through our country today that the rest of the world has seen this. And so uh, shame can often turn us against others, but sometimes when we realize that uh, we something we've done is wrong, we really wanna step up and make it better. And I think that's, that is just as likely. And, um, and I, so I'm with you. Um, um, so uh, that, that's really a, a tentative answer because you know, I really haven't absorbed it, but I do think that it could be very, what you're saying could be quite correct, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. It's not a great thing to say, but it's unfortunately a thought. Um, so here's a question also, what can we, this is from a farmer, what can we do as farmers to make the farming lobby which you have mentioned, obviously, the whole thing of GM and the whole th the roundup. Yeah. How can we make that more democratic? Well, I think what I've, what I've been thinking of, um, I don't have a simple answer, but I think that uh, Americans have very short <laughs> memories of our history. And the more that we can communicate that in the past there have been periods where we had policy of parity so that farmers' incomes were uh, protected, so they had purchasing power relative to consumers, and uh, that there was an active attempt to, to enable farming, um, that, that just uh, en enable farmers to, to get land and to stay on the land, that that's not a that's not an un-American idea that, that it succeeded in the past. And so I think that particular uh, approach, as now there has been legislation proposed to um, uh, make sure that black farmers can reclaim land because they have shrunk so much, their percentage have been so many racist policies that have pushed black farmers off the land. And so I think with the new administration, that would be one uh, note to strike that is right at the heart my more general answer is to remind us all that there have been periods in the past when we did better and how can we do that? And this is not an American way of approaching things to have these policies that really help the, 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 the um, it really assist the blossoming of those who've been disadvantaged in this one rule economy that just concentrates, concentrates well, that that uh, more democratic approach. I mean, that's when I came up in the 60s, I was part of the war on poverty. And the mm -hmm. goal was to go door to door and to help organize for greater equity. So there have been periods where we achieved it a lot more and we've got to remind ourselves of that. 
Yeah, and I, th I mean, I think it's interesting to go back. I mean, certainly in the UK, according to the London School of Economics, the, the period that had the most social nobility and the most equality was exactly the moment that I was trying to start, you know, starting a feminist magazine and you were writing your book. So even at that moment, one can still see the coming problems. So we haven't got much time left and we have a lot of questions. Um, I don't know which to pick because they're all quite, um, they're all quite tough. Um, so someone has asked, should we point the finger of blame more at our unquestioning faith in the free market and not in democracy? Um, I mean, I don't know whether we have faith in the free market. I mean, the free market is what we've got. And we have just, as you know, been through Brexit. So we have an even more free market than we did. And we're all kind of terrified of it. Right. I begin saying that forget that the word free market is just so false. It is so unfree. It is so concentrated yeah. that actually my theme is that if we have uh, antitrust and we encourage diverse uh, uh, businesses and cooperatives and some public ownership that we have, that then becomes more of a competitive market. We don't have one now. So we have to drop the whole idea that a market is free, works on its own. Every market has rules. What matters is the, are those rules, those that keep new players able to come in that that don't allow for the kind of concentration that we see today. I just want to point out again from the past that from the 1940s to the 1970s, that every income class in America doubled their real family income and the poorest class gained the most. So we can do this, but let's, I, I love that question because the free market is a mythology. There is no market without rules. And in, in green energy, for example, something called the uh, uh, renewable portfolio standard, it's, it's, it's a standard. It's setting the rules to encourage green energy. And, and there have been a lot of Republican states mm -hmm. and all who have gone along with that. It, they've got the language right. It's about standards. <laughs> well, that's a good note on which to leave it. But before we part, um, what would you say to everyone who's listening? And I know there are just loads of people out there who have just had a wonderful time with you. What would you what do you want people to do? Join a movement, write to their politicians, buy the right food, all of these things, all okay. of the more. Well, I think you got to find buddies who will keep, you know, find buddies who are as passionate as you are about this and commit to each other. We are social animals, remember my big theme here. Mm -hmm. And so if we commit to each other and all of the above are, are really, really important. But I think uh, alone we, we can feel so isolated. And and I, I want to also repeat my theme of it's not possible to know what's possible because that frees my spirit. We, we, there is no, um, we'll never know the full impact of our action, but we do know that if we retreat in fear, that that will uh, the, the the negative dynamic will just continue. So that's my best advice. Join with buddies. Hopefully, those are more risk takers than you are, because then you will become more one. And do what you thought you couldn't do. I like that. Do what you thought you couldn't do. Well, I think your your life is a wonderful example to all of us, and I'm incredibly grateful to you for sharing your life with all of us for the last hour and. Do everybody out there find Francis's book and look out for the new book, which will the new chapter, which will be coming in the in the autumn. I hope to England yes, as well. Right. Here it is. I've got the cover. The diet for the small planet. Um, it's a it's a cracker. Um, thank you very much indeed. Oh, um, very very kind. It's been great to meet you online and take care. Thank you so very much. Thank you all.